John Little John, United States Army, Vietnam. John served with the 1st Infantry Division, the Big Red One, 2nd of the 28th Infantry. He was with the Black Line Battalion. He was a squad leader in Vietnam, received two bronze stars for his actions in Vietnam. Just a, a great man. He's one of my heroes, one of my Vietnam heroes. And uh, John's story is significant as he tells it, like he told it to me in Spartanburg, South Carolina, March 21st, 2007. And these stories, folks, are like a fine wine. They're aging in time, and they are needful today for our society. Our younger generation needs to hear these stories. I get a lot of comments how these should be shown in all schools. This should be mandatory showing. And a lot of the people in this country that are against and anti-God, anti-military need to watch these films because these will open your heart to why we're free to the freedoms that we have. You know, my veterans, I look at the American flag and I see them woven into the cloth of that flag. You know, they are the reason I do my work. You know, and that's what we're fighting for, folks. We're fighting for the same freedoms in our own country today that our veterans fought for. And so John's story is, is coming to you today on the Voices of History channel. And I want to thank John Wynn. John is one of my supporters. He's sponsoring this particular story. He was born in Vietnam and has a tremendous story of his own that I hope to record someday soon. And he's very passionate about this country, about the freedoms that we have, and about our Vietnam veterans. And John, I look into this camera, I salute you and thank you for your passion, your dedication. And I want to thank everybody that's sponsoring and helping support my work. It's because of you that we're able to bring these stories, the complete interviews that I did with the veterans. They're all, all these interviews have been done. Now we're bringing them to you. A lot of blood, sweat, and tears are going into this, and we're doing it for you because we care. And many people need to hear these stories. So anyways, bring the grandkids, your kids, great-grandkids around and have them watch these stories because freedom is not free, folks. Freedom is earned, and the price of freedom is going on today. And like I said, we're fighting for the same freedoms in our own country today that our veterans fought for. So I'm happy to bring you John's story. If you'd like to support one of these stories or sponsor one of these stories, there's information in the video description and in the comment section. So God bless you. Thank you for watching. And I present to you John Little John. Tell me again what year you went to Vietnam, John. I went to Vietnam in uh, 66. I got there in December of 66, and I stayed 67, and I left there in 68. Okay, and you were, basic training was where? Uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. Okay. Fort Polk, Louisiana. Infantry. Infantry. Right. I was in infantry. I had airborne training. What age at that time? I was 19, uh, almost 20. Were you drafted? I was RA. I enlisted right out of high school. Did you feel a real sense of duty to serve your country then? or? Well, yes, because my father served in World War II, and he was an uh, infantryman in Germany mm -hmm. back during the war. And I felt it was my duty and my obligation to serve my country, so I joined. Um, what, what were your thoughts about Vietnam at that time? Was it something that you realized you were going to go there when you, when you went into the military? And how did you feel as a young man at that time? Well, I, I felt like it was a, a obligation and a duty to serve my country because they was, at that time, talking about communist aggression. And we also had the bail pigs in Cuba. And the United States was over there in the advisory role and Vietnam had begun to escalate, and I figured if I go in, I would probably end up in Vietnam. So that's why I took a lot of extra training, such as jungle training, airborne. So 
So you're a young man, you, you've been trained, and then you find yourself in Vietnam. Tell me what you remember about the first time you were in country, if you got off an airplane, and what, it, what, it, well, what happened? Well, when I went over, I went over on a Braniff airline. They, they transported us to Vietnam. And when I first got there, it's a third world country, and uh, the smell of the country and uh, the terrain, the atmosphere was entirely different than what I was used to. And uh, it was a kind of an eerie feeling to see all those tents and military tanks and planes and helicopters. It was a, a trying experience for me when I first got there. What about the country? Is it, was it a pretty country? I mean, maybe you didn't see a whole lot at that time. Were there well, smells? Was it hot? Well, it was very hot over there. It was a hot climate, and uh, you had a lot of dust because you didn't have a lot of paved roads. You had the monsoon season. Uh, it would rain, and about 10 minutes later, it was so dusty. Uh, the country at night was one of the most beautiful countries that you could see. The stars was beautiful, black drop uh, sky. Uh, it was so peaceful. It was just like, hey, are we in a war? And then all of a sudden, all hell would break loose. You know, you get hit by the Viet Cong insurgents, and uh, it was all over the country. You had no real safe haven in Vietnam because it's kind of like Iraq today, you fighting your enemies all over. Uh, they come out and associate with you in the daytime. At night, you would encounter them in combat. So it was a tough situation. Tell me again the unit, were you with the 1st Infantry? I was with the 1st Infantry Division called the Bloody Red One. It was the 2nd and 28th Infantry, Black Line Battalion. And our motto was duty first, no sacrifice too great, no mission too difficult, duty first. And uh, I served under some uh, very elite generals at that time, General John Hay, General Depew, uh, General Hollinsworth, and my commander was General William C. Westmoreland from this area. Quite a man. Uh, yeah, I had the unique opportunity to shake hands with him personally as he pinned my first Bronze Star Medal on me in Vietnam in April of 67. Do you have a picture of that? Uh, yes, I, do. I, I have a picture, but over the years I hadn't been able to come up with that picture. You know, when you have pictures from the war and they shipped out back home and uh, you let, you have old treasury chests and things get tossed around and I have a lot of pictures though of, of Vietnam. Right. You didn't bring them with you but you have them somewhere? Right. I have some pictures that I brought with okay. me uh, that would uh, let you know basically what the country is like. Okay. Right. Anything else you have in addition I'd be interested in seeing sometimes. So okay. Great. And uh, we went on quite a few missions in Vietnam. Yeah, I want to ask you about that now. Um, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but just, just as a young man in Vietnam, did you feel invincible? Did you feel like nothing could happen to me? And then at what point do you realize that this is for real and you could get killed? Well, when I first went over, after all the training that we had, especially at Fort Benning, Georgia, and Fort Polk, Louisiana, which was a training area right before you go to Vietnam, that was uh, where you receive all your jungle training, escape and evasions, and uh, combat assault. And they kind of prepared me for what I would be going into, so it wasn't such a shock because I knew that, uh, that we was going to encounter, you know, combat with the enemy, and I knew their method that they used in Vietnam, we was kind of uh, had simulated uh, uh, POW camps and uh, uh, Vietnam base camps, how they would be set up. So we kind of got a feel for all of that before I got there. And after I was in Vietnam, uh, uh, a lot of things changed uh, because we started engaging the enemy more. 
and we uh, had a lot of firefights and a lot of men were shot, wounded, and then you realize uh, the urgent situation there that your life is in danger every move that you make because they would set booby traps from the bombs that was dropped that did not detonate. Uh, they would build punji pits and things like that uh, that would cause our men to have problems. And uh, that was uh, something that you had to fear every time you go out because you never knew where, the, where they would pop up we would fight in the Four North. We would fight at the Mekong Delta, Four South as you could go in Vietnam. And we also had uh, insurgents coming over from Cambodia and Laos. Um, back during the 60s, uh, you didn't hear too much about Laos or Cambodia because uh, more or less we were supposed to have been engaging the enemy from the north. but. Uh, they was already had sympathizers in the South, which was called the Viet Cong. Those are the people we was fighting. And we also fought the North Vietnamese hardcore from the North, from the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So what, you're an infantry soldier, you're a grunt, you have an M16? I was a infantry soldier. I had uh, my own squad in Vietnam. I had my riflemen, my automatic weapon. Uh, personnel, my radio personnel, I had my map, I could call in airstrikes or artillery, I could read a map like the back of my hand because I was trained to do that. And uh, I had to call in my location and if there was any enemy activities out in front of me then I would have to uh, 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 call in their location and have artillery fire on them. And, you know, we was constantly always out on ambushes, setting up our claymore mines, setting up for the enemy and watching, observing. Uh, we have a base camp, we'll dig in, and then we'll send a squad out to do what we call reconnaissance. And you with, with the recon squad then? Uh, later on, uh, after I was in Vietnam for a while, I went to the 5th Special Forces and trained as a long-range recon patrol leader. So you're a squad leader? Yes, sir, I was a so, squad leader. So what, what type of c commands or things are you having your men do at times? And did you lose some of these people, and how did how'd you feel? Well, I lost some of the people, especially on that April day when I received my first Bronze Star with V device for Valor. Um, we was walking all day and uh, we come to this clearance and we went into the uh, like the rubber plantation over there coming out of the dense jungle and we became you know we was under heavy fire from the Viet Cong and we lost a lot of men we had a bunch wounded and when bullets are flying and and things are happening the adrenaline is flowing and you're going to react I did a lot of things that was probably heroic, uh, but I didn't realize what I had done until after it was all over. Then you say, boy, did I do that? Uh, I survived that. So it was a tough situation over there because we was put in harm's way just by being out there uh, searching for the enemy. We went on a lot of search and destroy missions. Tell me what that is. Search and destroy is where you take a company out on a reconnaissance of the area. Uh, your commanders, they have uh, information that they are enemy activity in the area. And when you go out there, you're searching for the enemy. We used to have to go into these base camps uh, like uh, the North Vietnamese, South Viet Cong. They would set up uh, base camps along the way and they'll have their rice uh uh, stored the ammunition. We would go in and uh, capture their weapons, uh, destroy their rice, and we'll go in and, and find out information. We have found maps uh, of their unit. Uh, we have found dead bodies that, you know, we had engaged them because the Viet Congs were very smart. They would take their dead 
and uh, dragged them off, and it was hard for us to get an accurate body count. Um, I hate to say that uh, our commanders at that time would tell us if we got a Viet Cong, we cut their ears off, and we used that for a body count. Um, but overall, search and destroy, we're out there to find the enemy, engage the enemy, and uh, you know, do what we have to do to uh, apprehend them. Um, we took a couple prisoners when I was over there. So tell me about combat. Well, how would you define combat? Combat is a reactionary situation. When you're out there fighting, you're walking along, you're very intense, uh, you're looking for the enemy, and then all of a sudden when the bullets start flying and the grenades going off and the rockets are coming in, uh, the planes are overhead dropping bombs, uh, combat is a survival. Uh, you put in a situation and then you start reacting at the moment it happened. Uh, you start firing your weapons, making sure your men are covered. You cover your flanks to your left, your right. Uh, you deploy your men in, in areas that they can put down the maximum firepower so you can uh, overtake or, or engage your enemy more powerful. We would go in. If it's a hot LZ, they throw in the red smoke. And when the choppers come in, they wouldn't set down completely. They'll have about three feet of clearance from the ground, and you have to jump off, and uh, you're under fire. You have to deploy your men, get them in position, take cover. Most of the time, we have the Army engineers would clear out different areas for landing zones where we can go into these areas. And then we had also the maypalm that they would drop they would go in and kill the vegetation and, and drop the maypalm and also Agent Orange. I was in that pretty powerful because I, I would be within 100 or 200 yards where they was dropping the uh, Agent Orange. You could see it coming out of the back of those C-130s. Did that affect you after Vietnam? Well, yeah, I've had some problems. Uh, uh, I'm in relative decent health. I'm a disabled veteran now. Uh, I get roughly 80% disability from the military. I have uh, uh, diabetes. I have uh, glaucoma. And I'm also high blood, sh high blood pressure. I have hypertension. Uh, but I'm on medication for that. And uh, I have neuropathy from Vietnam. I have problems with my feet for his walking and stuff like that, but I'm, I'm still able to maneuver pretty good. I'm 60 years old and uh, thank God I made it back from Vietnam. What about your squad? How close do you get to your men in a, in a combat situation? Well, you're very close to your men in combat because you get to know your uh, soldier that is next to you. You get to know his family. Uh, we have mail call out there, and, and you see pictures of your men's family, and, and you get to know more about them. So we like blood brothers. We kind of stick together, cover each other back. Uh, one gets shot or something, the other soldier move up to try to you know, take care of his wounded comrade. It's a situation, it, it bothers me this day because I saw a lot of my, my buddies get gunned down over there. And uh, you had to bag them up and they had tags that they would put on them called KIA, Kill in Action. And the toughest part of that would be to go back and write their families and tell them how their sons was killed in battle. And as of this day, I have vivid memories of a lot of the guys that was in my unit because as I stated earlier, I was in a fighting unit 
and we volunteered for a lot of missions. And we would always go out on any search and destroy mission, uh, any big operation come up, my commanders always had us there. And I remember very distinct Shenandoah II. That was one major operation in Vietnam where we had 58 KIAs that day. And I was in Echo Company. Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie Company was wiped out. Small arms fire, artillery? Uh, well, you had small arms fire, and uh, when they was engaging the enemy, we had to fire for close effect, and some of our own artillery was in on top of us. Uh, because the only way you could break contact with the enemy when they have you in a horseshoe ambush. See, we walked into what you call a horseshoe ambush and the killing field, the firing was so great that we had to call for heavy artillery and drop it in on our location in order to break contact. We had a lot of men killed that day. So when you're in the heat of battle as a squad leader, I mean, is, does it get chaotic? Is everything organized? Are you on the radio? I mean, it, what do you do? It get chaotic because you, your adrenaline is flowing, you're reacting, you, you're hollering to your left flank, right flank to make sure you're covered, making sure you, all your men have enough ammunition, making sure that uh, you have the right amount of firepower in the area that you need it. And then you got to uh, uh, engage your enemy. Uh, you have to maneuver forward. Uh, you can't just stay pinned down. You got to get the upper hand on your enemy. So you have to deploy or redeploy your troops or try to uh, uh, advance your troops in the area where they can do the most damage. And you have to be ever mindful of the situation. You got to know what you're doing. And when you react, you don't have a time to have a second thought about it. You got to do it right then. And when you do it then, uh, whatever action you do, going to determine how well you do in battle. And I've always said, and I say it to this day, even the guys in Iraq, uh, situations that happen, sometimes we overreact. And that's all in combat because you can't help but to react. Your life is in danger, your friend's life is in danger, so you're going to do whatever it takes to silence the enemy. And, and we did whatever it took. How close did you personally get to the enemy, John? I mean, was it like the distance you and I are, or was it always distance firing? Or? It wasn't distance. I had a lot of distance fire. I had uh, close combat. I was within 40, 50 yards. I could see the enemy shooting at me. Uh, they had what you call L trenches, where they set up their little mortar rounds, and they fire them into our area. And uh, I've had quite a bit of close combat. Um, where I could actually see the enemy. Uh, As you fired at him, could you see him go down or scream? Or? Well, you could see some of the enemies being hit, and you look back over your left shoulder, maybe one of your guys got hit. Uh, and we, we always had medics with us, and when a guy go down, one of your fellow soldiers, you holler for the medic to advance. Uh, you could see them dragging their enemies off. Uh, they would always be camouflaged into the terrain. Uh, they wore black pajamas, the Viet Cong. Now the uh, North Vietnamese regulars, they had more uniform uh, uh, gear and everything like the American soldiers. The Viet Cong, they fought on the run. They would hit and run. They'll hit you here. They'll hit you to the left. Uh, they'll hit you in the rear. 
and then they would go back into these villages and when we go in uh, we'd have to get permission if we could fire on the village or things like that. You just couldn't just open fire on a village because you had the farmers and the peasants that was there and uh, they didn't have uh, very much in the countryside. Uh, they would have the rice patties and they had the uh, buffalo cows and things that oxen that they used to do the cultivating of the land. And it was basically uh, more or less a lot of jungle out there. And then when you go into a village, it, it, it wasn't uh, modernized. It was just a backwards third world country. Did you ever find your mind trying to make sense of things happening around you, the death, the destruction, or was it just the fact that this is war, it's happening, and then maybe later you thought about it? Well, we thought about it because you had a lot of guys, they would hear about things back home, what was happening here. It was an unpopular war because the American people wasn't behind us all the way. And you heard things like that. And it would make you second guess your decision. Why am I here? Why am I fighting? And uh, then you would hear from your buddies and they write you and tell you how bad things were back in the States about Vietnam. And then you begin to... Uh, say, well, is it worth it? And I've seen a lot of guys just literally shoot themselves to keep from going back to the jungle. And we had a phrase over there, we call it short timers. When they got short and they ready to go back to the United States, a lot of them would go on sick call or they would shoot themselves so they wouldn't have to go back into battle. And that I would say it wasn't a, something to be proud of, but it happened a lot in Vietnam. It's a lot of things the public didn't get told, but it was fought in the media. You could see things happening out there because um, the American public lived with Vietnam every day on television. They saw the bodies coming back to Dover, Delaware, which we don't see now in Iraq but we paid a heavy price for a war that seemingly uh, did not end. And for it to end the way it did, I think some of the things I did was really in vain. I really do. Are you, were you a religious man back then, or was it, did you ever rely on your faith in God, or was it just your training that got you through the hard times? Well, I... I was very young. I joined the church at a very young age. I was 11 years old when I first received salvation. Uh, I came from a religious family. They was church-going people. Uh, I was brought up in a church atmosphere. So I relied very much on, on uh, uh, my religious aspect of being in battle. I also relied a lot on my training because I had a lot of good training back in the States and I had to use a lot of that in combat and I'm glad I was well prepared. I carried more ammunition, more grenades than the average soldier would carry because I wanted to be prepared for battle. I took care of my M16 so that it wouldn't jam on me because we had a lot of soldiers over there that let their weapons get in bad shape. And when they went into battle, a lot of those weapons jammed. And we had problems with those weapons when we first got there because of the terrain, uh, the monsoon seasons, and things like that. But that's basically it. Tell me the citation of what you did for the Bronze Stars. I know you say when you're in battle it happens and you're not trying to be heroic, but what, why did you get your Bronze Stars? Where were you and what was going on? Well, my first Bronze Star was in April of 67. Uh, we was on a search and destroy mission. 
Uh, we had been out all day long, and this was on a Sunday. I, I, could, I can visualize it right now. And we had been out, and we were walking. We hadn't had a bath in maybe a month, and we'd been eating sea rations, no hot food. And we came upon a, a Viet Cong ambush they had set. And uh, we had guys that was wounded. Our gunner was from Tennessee, the machine gunner, and he was shot through the head. And he had fired so many weapons with that M60 machine gun that the barrel had turned cherry red. And see, we carried two extra barrel for our automatic weapon uh, so that we can put down heavy fire. Uh, he was killed that day, and then I had uh, another PFC, and I can call his name vividly right now. It was PFC Glover. Uh, he was shot from the stomach up, and uh, I had to move forward because the way we was engaging the enemy, they had us locked in, so I had to get up close where I could knock their automatic weapon out and there I launched three grenades into their area. I could see them to my extreme left, and they was firing the mortar rounds. And when I threw those grenades and got up there close, I was able to uh, silence that machine gun position. And one of my uh, gunners was shot, and I had to pull him back. And, uh, and after I did that, I... Uh, call in uh, for air support, and we also had the uh, choppers to come in and take our wounded out, and we kind of cut a landing path for them to get in there to get our wounded out. Did you get to assist any of the wounded at times, or did you just let the medics do it, or did you ever get the help? I had uh, one of my buddies behind me that got shot, I had to put a tourniquet on his shoulder where he got shot through the back and through the front. See, when you're in battle, a lot of times bullets are flying, you may get hit by one of your own soldiers. And that have happened in Vietnam. And I'm pretty sure it happened in Iraq. But uh, things like that do happen in battle. And I put a tourniquet. <clears throat> I had one gentleman that was shot through the jaw and the bullet come out, I had to put a tourniquet on him. Uh, so, are these men conscious? Are they screaming? Did you give morphine? Well, they, when the guy that was shot in the jaw, <clears throat> he wasn't screaming. It was just that blood was coming out, and uh, he couldn't talk because of the way he was shot. And when you get hit with an AK-47, that bullet turns head over in, and when it comes in, it tears in, and it leaves a big hole when it comes out. And uh, he lost all of his uh, jaw, fascias, and chin area, and we had to kind of bandage him up to try to stop the bleeding. But uh, the medics, uh, they kind of stay on top of things when they get up there especially when you're in combat, people do things, uh, they do things in a way that you can't imagine because they're operating in, in hostile conditions. And when, like I said before, when bullets are flying, it's a terrible feeling. The body reacts. Uh, I had to cut my pants leg because the bullets were so close it felt like it had hit my leg. And I was cutting my pants leg to see was I hit. But that's how close we was in combat, fighting. So it's a tough situation. What about the medevacs? Uh, you're calling them in, they come in, did you get the help with that? Or is that a pretty organized scene? Or is it under, under fire that these medevacs are coming in? Well, some of it is under fire. And normally we can get a lot of firepower assistance uh, when we're sending the medevacs in. We usually secure the area. 
Uh, most medevacs, when they come in, the area is pretty secure. Now, you do have small weapons fire in the area, but we try to make sure that it's no heavy weaponry fire when they come in. We try to secure much of the area. And most of them in Vietnam, they was pretty secure. Uh, I remember distinctly the guy that was killed from Tennessee. I put his body on the chopper and one of the gunners kicked him off. And I almost lost it. I turned my weapon at him, the gunner on the chopper. But I realized that you must get you wounded out first. You know, the combat that you guys experience at that young age, I just, it's hard for me to imagine other than listening to you tell it, but, uh, and then having survived all that. I mean, when you were fighting over there, were you conscious of, of what you're doing, uh, fighting for God and country, or was it just a matter of survival for you guys? Well, when I first went over, I thought I was fighting for our country. And then after I was there for a while, it was just strictly survival, being able to survive because the enemy was a smart enemy that we was fighting. They could carry uh, a lot. They were small, but they could carry a lot. They could carry a lot of uh, food with them. They carried their rice. They, because after hearing so much of what was going on in America, you know that the people back home was not for you. And uh, once you get a feel that your country is not all the way behind you, you begin to wonder whether it's worth being in Vietnam. And uh, your main concern become then is to survive, to get back home. How about after the war? Um, did it bother you? Um, did you did you have problems with it after the war, sorting it out? Did you talk about it? Well, after the war, I had problems, but I never talked about it. It took me basically almost 10, maybe 10 or 12 years before I could talk to anyone about Vietnam. I would not even talk to people about it, express it. Uh, they talk about debriefing. When I came from Vietnam, I was given a uniform, my orders for my next duty station, came home on leave for 30 days. Uh, I was back in the military. I never was debriefed, uh, asked about conditions that I lived under. None of this stuff came about in Vietnam. We was put back into society. You either go to work or get a job. Uh, no one addressed the issues of, of uh, post-traumatic stress or, or combat fatigue. Uh, we never was critiqued on those things. Uh, for 10 years, I never talked about Vietnam. I kept it locked up inside me. I did notice one thing. Every night, I would get up about 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. And I still do that today. To this day, I cannot sleep all the way through eight or nine hours sleep. I'll get up and I'll usually look around the house, check, make sure the doors are locked or, or I'm listening for things. Uh, I wasn't aware of it until I started seeing a doctor at VA and seeing one of the uh, psychologists, and she was telling me that that probably post-traumatic stress. And, uh, you know, things like that happen. Are there sights, sounds, or smells that bring back Vietnam? I know you just mentioned the night thing, but are there things that bring it back, the memories? Well, what brings it back, sometime I can go out on my patio at home and look up in the sky, look so peaceful, and, and I can remember those beautiful skies in Vietnam. But, uh, you know, uh, the thing that hurts me the most is our country not really declaring Vietnam a war. They declared it a conflict. 
but we lost over 50 some thousand men in Vietnam. And I think it should have been declared a war. You ever been to the Vietnam Wall in Washington? I've been once. And, uh, Tell me why you went and what you experienced there. Well, it was a moment of hurt, sadness. Uh, it was a tearful moment for me because I would choke up. Because if I saw names that I knew and men's that I was with, it bothered me. And today, I wonder how their family feel right now. Uh, I was a lucky man because I was in combat. I mean, I fought the whole time I was in Vietnam. I didn't have a lot of relaxation. I did get a couple of R&Rs over there where I left the country. I had to come back. But, uh, but it was just a, a trying situation. Tough. You ever feel guilty for surviving? Did you go through any of that or survivor's guilt or? Well, in the 60s, when you're that young, I think you feel hurt more than guilt when you lose a comrade, someone you share a bunk next to, or you share a foxhole, you share some intimate moments about their family, their relationships with their girlfriends back home, that hurts. And then you look up, that person is no longer there. We would always, after combat, when you lose so many men, we would come back to the rear, take our bayonet, stick our weapon, in the ground, put the helmet on top of the weapon, the boots, and then we have our ceremony uh, to honor our dead. And that was a time that, that really touched because we knew we had an awesome task to pack that fellow's belonging up and ship it back home. That was probably some of the toughest things that I had to do. Sometimes you, it's hard to talk about that. It's, it's just like we're doing this here today. I haven't done an interview of this magnitude in a long time. I've done interviews for little kids that doing uh, projects at school. Uh, I did two for two young men in my church and they made an A-plus on that project. Well, you read the article in the paper. What prompted you to call me and, and maybe you want to tell your story? You know, you know what prompted me, believe it or not, I was sitting at my desk at work and my sales manager came around and he said, they got an article in the paper. He said, you need to read this. And he told me about it. Uh, I normally read the paper every day or I go on the internet and see what's new in the news. And uh, he said, you need to check into that. So I immediately got on the phone and called you. And uh, uh, you made me feel like that uh, this was something that you was doing to help America understand the reason why. Since I've gotten older, I understand that I'm a, I'm a history guy. I love history. And I understand the reason why they was fighting Vietnam. It was a lot of political aspirations that they was trying to fulfill during the Johnson administration and the McNamara days at the uh, Pentagon, uh, we were more or less trying to save this country from a recession. And I guess war was something that they could employ a lot of people. A lot of people went to work, a lot of overtime was made, 
A lot of war material was made from General Dynamics, the textile industry boomed from Vietnam. But at what cost? 58,000 lives. That's a, that's a great sacrifice. John, as an American citizen and as a veteran of uh, Vietnam, what does freedom mean to you? Freedom means being able to take your family where they want to go, enjoy America. Freedom means to be able to speak whatever you want to speak, being able to criticize without repercussion, being able to vote for whoever you want to be president without any repercussion, being able to worship the way you want to, being able to have a voice in your state and local government, that's freedom. A lot of countries don't have that. America was founded on the principle of religious freedom, being able to have rights, the Bill of Rights, to do things in this country, to own land, to, own, to vote, uh, to set up free enterprise without someone coming in telling you you can't do this. America is probably the greatest country on earth, but we absolutely cannot police the whole world. Uh, there are people out there with different moral values than we have in this country. But I think we have to understand that the world is different. Uh, America is the forefront in freedom around the world. Uh, we fought for our freedom from the British. And I think America has made its stand in the world today. What does the American flag mean and represent to you? When I see the American flag, it, it gives me a sense of pride, sense of honor, sense of dignity, sense of devotion, love for your country. Even now when I go to a ball game or some kind of event where the flag is raised, I automatically come to attention place my hand over my heart. If I got my uniform on, I salute. Uh, I do all those things simply because I know that freedom is a price you have to pay. And I can go back to all the wars that America has fought in. There have always been sacrifices and just to be able to serve your country and believe in your country. I think we all have to have that kind of belief and inner feeling that America is a country to be proud of. And if you go to my home right now and walk in my bathroom, my wife, she fixed my bathroom up and all the American flag. If you walk in there and you say, boy, this guy is patriotic. Uh, I've always been patriotic because when I joined the military, I wasn't drafted. I wasn't a U.S. I was a RA. I can vividly sit right here and tell you my serial number was RA1493752. Seven nine two five. We get it right, but see, those are things that never leave you when you believe in something. And I believe what I was doing was the right thing at that time. But since I've gotten older and studied history and studied the political system, I've learned that America has made mistakes but it still doesn't say America isn't a great country. We are. 
Well said. Well, real quick, back to Vietnam, your second Bronze Star, what did you get that for? Where were you at and what did you do? I was in Tainan Province, an area they call Black Virgin Mountain in, in Vietnam. That was in the northern province. Uh, it's up Highway 13. And uh, we was fighting with the 4th Infantry Division, 1st Air Cav, and the 25th Infantry Division. And we was fighting with the 4th Mechanized Unit. <clears throat> and we was on a mission. We had all of those units trying to get to the base of that mountain. And uh, that was a area in Vietnam where the North Vietnamese had a lot of their supplies. And it was a trail that they used to come down from the north, and that was one of their staging areas. And we was deep into the countryside and uh, the 1st Infantry Division took the lead of all the divisions that was out there. And I was out in that area and we came up upon a large force that attacked us. And they attacked us from all sides. And uh, we was in heavy combat and uh, I was under fire. My machine, my radio man, man was beside me, and he was young, and he was trying to keep his head down because bullets was flying. And uh, I call in air strikes, heavy artillery on the enemy, and we engaged the enemy. And uh, it was two to my left flank that I know that we was able to destroy. I saw that with my own eyes. And uh, I fired a Claymore mine, and I threw some grenades, and we was able to, to take care of that flank. And uh, I cut a landing path for our helicopter to land and get our wounded staged in the area. And I took charge of the situation and my commander in the air, they heard me on the radio on the ground, and uh, he saw, he heard my actions and the way I handled myself, and I was awarded the Bronze Star. And General William Westmoreland, he was a commanding general, he's from this area, he pinned the Bronze Star on me. Sure did. We're just about at the end, but is there anything else, combat, uh, any other story you might want to share with me? Um, if not, I'm going to move on. But um, Well, there's some graphic stuff. I don't know whether this would be relevant to talk about. It's, it's a lot of things that have them inside the country because you had some guys that was, uh, well, you had a little, little bit of racial tension in Vietnam. Of course, it was the 60s and we was coming off the civil rights movement. And a lot of things went on, but we were still at war and we were still in a hostile conditions. Uh, we had some of our own soldiers to kill each other over there. This is something that you don't hear about too often. I've, I've seen that. I've been in the area where it happened. Uh, and I wonder to this day, were the people ever told the truth? Uh, we had villages in Vietnam. Guys could go down and visit with the local girls in the bars. and It's a lot of things went on over there. And I guess that's why we had a lot of children and babies left behind in Vietnam. A lot of those things happen. And drug uses, was that prevalent? Drug uses was normal in Vietnam. Uh, it was very easy to get. Uh, it was used in combat quite a bit because if you're under a lot of extreme conditions and a lot of pressure, and a lot of guys use that as a result to uh, ease their tensions. 
and to take their minds away from the war. That did happen. Are you proud that you're a Vietnam veteran? I'm proud that I'm a Vietnam veteran. I'm proud that I've served in the military because I came from a family that served in the military. And they, they all receive honorable discharges. And I'm proud of the situation. Do you think Vietnam changed you as a person from before, during, and after, for better or for worse? I think Vietnam changed me a lot. It let me understand the American system, why we fight wars. Uh, How about during combat? Did you become a different person when you're killing people? Well, in combat, when you lose comrades and you come back to the rear and you have your uh, services for your war dead, it really changed you quite a bit because you become more aggressive. Uh, you want to kill someone. Uh, it does change you. It changes your whole outlook because it makes you want to do something to someone. When you look back and say you're my best buddy and you're no longer here anymore, I want to get revenge. So it does change. How about transitioning back into civilian life? Was that hard for you? One moment you're in combat, next moment you're back here? It wasn't hard because I, I tried to get my mind off a lot of things. I wouldn't talk about Vietnam for those 10 years. And when I came back, by me not talking about it, I think it helped me quite a bit. But in the long run, I think it hurt me a lot because I should have talked about it more, but I kept it inside of me. And uh, when I began to talk about it, I felt better. I felt better about myself. One more question. What should people remember about Vietnam and the war? People should remember that Vietnam was one of America's greatest mistakes. They should remember that there was a lot of patriotism in America. We believe what our government told us, that we was fighting communist aggression. People should realize that there were sacrifices made Young men and women gave their lives. And I think we should never forget that Vietnam was a time in America life where we learned warfare on foreign soil, invading another country, what we have to sacrifice, what we had to give up. Uh, We've always fought wars on foreign soil, but a country like Vietnam did not have much to offer America. Uh, we was fighting against the hearts and soul of the people of Vietnam. America should not forget the 58,000 lives and the men and women that are having problems today from this war, I think they ought to really help them take the hats off. I look at these pictures of you. When you look at these pictures, is that you? Do you can you remember that? I mean, you look like you look pretty good, man. <laughs> Just a little bit younger, but look, you look pretty. I don't think I'd want to mess with you. Well, when I look back, sometimes uh, it brings back memories. You know, when you when you're young like that and your family is military and you, you want to be the best that you can be, uh, it makes you think, you know, the things that you did to get to where you are make you proud. And I just, I just want people to realize that 
Vietnam is not the only war that America has been involved in. And we're not the only one that made sacrifices. Uh, I just want America to make the right decisions when we go to war. That is for the right reasons and not for political gains. I think America would probably, in which they are today, still the greatest nation on earth. I'm gonna ask you to do one more thing at the end okay. of my interviews, and I know you're not in uniform, so understand, but for the camera and for the sake of the interview, could I have you give me a salute into the camera from where you're seated when I tell you? Yeah. That'd be okay? All right. Okay, John, right in the camera. Great, thank you.